Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the STS Hot Topics Committee's um, spring um, session, our winter 2023 session. Our topic today is engaging undergraduate students from marginalized groups in research. We have two excellent speakers for you who will introduce a little bit more formally as the program gets underway. A few reminders for today's session. We have been, and as you noted, we are going to be recording. So please just make sure if you wanna have yourself on video that you can do that or um, take yourself off if you'd like. Either way, you will be muted also during the session. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. We have several moderators today who will be looking at those and will be helping to moderate those questions when it is time for Q&A. Our session today is an hour and a half long. We will begin with two speaker presentations, each for 20 minutes. After each speaker is completed, we'll have an open question and answer period for 10 minutes. And then after that, we will cut off the recording and then we'll have breakout session rooms. So we'll have um, our moderators um, you know, across the different breakout rooms helping to engage in um, specific questions um, related to the program. And we'll be doing that for 20 minutes. And then we'll end coming all together with a um, full group discussion about the topic um, towards the end of the session. So we'll hope you'll be able to join us for the entire thing. And um, I believe that's all for me. I will, um, and also I'm Sandy Avila. I'm one of the co-chairs of the committee, along with Isabella Baxter. Um, both of us are co-chairs this year for um, STS Hot Topic. So I'll let um, Amy introduce our first speaker. Hello, my name is Amy Schelke and I'm on the planning committee for today's event and it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague at Salt Lake Community College. Um, Emmanuel Santa Martinez is an assistant professor of biology at Salt Lake Community College. SLCC. Since Emmanuel joined SLCC in August of 2019, he has been teaching organismal biology courses and supervises independent research projects that are now part of his curriculum. He also created the first bilingual introduction to biology in Spanish and English. Emmanuel collaborates in agricultural and pollination biology projects and has established semester long research projects where SLCC students have the opportunity to explore plant pollinator interactions. Aside from his biology background, Emmanuel advocates for fairness and equity among all students with the intent of creating a culture of inclusion and equal access to a high quality education. He obtained his PhD in entomology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2017. His PhD research focused on understanding the foraging behavior of different bee species and how these pollinators can impact gene flow and self-pollination in agriculture. In his spare time, Emmanuel enjoys hiking, camping, kayaking, cooking, and exploring the outdoors. Uh, welcome, Emmanuel. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Um, thank you all for having me. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me, Amy and Isabella. So I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Uh, let me go and find it quickly. OK. Um, all right. Here is it. OK. OK, so like you said, I'm from Salt Community College. I joined the college in 2019. So I've been um, at this great community college you know, for years now. And since then, me and my colleague, Dr. Melissa Hardy, have been introducing research into our curriculum. So I'm going to be mentioning uh, her name quite a bit in this presentation. So basically, today, I'm going to be presenting to you like the incorporation of undergraduate research and base education um, and how that impact uh, overall students, especially for other represented students. So let me see. Oh, here it is. All right. So we need to make sure to tell you that the um, Southern Community College is actually the most diverse uh, college in Utah. So that means we have a lot of different, different backgrounds, experiences, and preparation. But also with that, um, there could be potentially some challenges in terms of like, you know, language barrier. Everyone comes from like different preparations as well. So we need to like meet the students where they are. And then we have been thinking about research for a long time because there's actually um, reports and even data out there that supports research increasing actually the success of students, especially for minority um, students in STEM. Okay, so there is actually now a report here from Vision and Change. Uh, basically indicates that having research in our curriculum energized biology student, but mostly helps students from underrepresented communities that are in STEM here in the United States. So by reading 
different articles around. And then we wanted to try this um, starting in like fall 2020. So we started with our course called College Biology 2. Um, this is a course that nationwide, um, there are multiple colleges that actually have research and they require students to do research. We haven't done it you know, before 2019 at SOCC. So we started doing this in fall 2020. Um, this is a major biology course, which means um, all students need to take this class. Um, right now, basically students complete the associates um, and as part of that, they need to take this course or even if you're gonna transfer to a four year institution, you need to pass through this course as well, if you are in biology. Uh, this course per se focus on organism biology, which means you're gonna be looking at things at the macro level, so which that means plants, animals, the environment, ecology. Um, and this course at the moment is taught by myself and then Dr. Melissa Hardy. So we wanted to start doing research here um, and see how does that look like in other classes later, okay? So we actually have a lecture component and we actually have the lab. And then both Melissa and myself actually are the responsible of teaching both the lab and the lecture. So we actually have two research projects, one in lecture and actually one in lab. So I'm gonna get to both uh, in a bit. So we're gonna start first with the lecture and how does that look like? So during the pandemic, we were like, um, we're not, we're not seeing like students doing well with the final comprehensive exam. That means, you know, you have all the materials for the entire semester dump into one final exam and then the averages were kind of low. I'm gonna show you some statistics about that in just a bit. Um, and then we were thinking about, well, let's do research. And actually some of our topics, students can just do it outside without actually going into the lab. So that's why in the lecture, first of all, we wanted to replace the final comprehensive exam and then Melissa and I created two uh, projects that students can actually go into the field while the pandemic was actually happening. Um, and then you collect your own data. Like you do not need to interact with anyone, um, you know, because of course the six feet and all that. Um, so we come out with like two projects that actually completely replace the final uh, exam. And then it went so well that actually we decided to like keep this going on even post pandemic. And still to today, we have replaced the final exam basically with two projects that we have created, okay? So there are actually a couple of other new faculty joining us to teach this class. So I'm gonna focus only right now on the project that Melissa and I have created. But when you bring this opportunity for students, um, they actually are a little bit intimidated because it's like, I had never done research. I don't know how does that look like. So our job is to basically guide them from the beginning to the end. That's basically an entire semester. And then we prepare our Canvas site or basically the website for the course um, with different materials and videos that will help you like what it is a question, what is hypothesis, how to create that. So you can see here, this is what the module look like on our Canvas site, basically telling you what's the purpose of doing research, what is the scientific methodology. And then we actually let the students read through these projects um, and then whatever is your interest, if you're interested in doing something more aquatic versus something more pollinator, you choose whatever you think you're more attracted to. So once you select your project, of course, together with the students with myself, uh, we're gonna help you basically build that whole project. Um, we provide, like you can see here, um, some pages that include how to analyze the data. So if the students follow these videos, um, they can actually analyze the data without any problem. And we actually provide also as well, the rubrics um, to show them how we're gonna evaluate them. So again, students at first, you will see it, the first couple of weeks are a little bit intimidated to see like, how does that look like? So we divide different assignments throughout the entire semester to guide them uh, little by little. Like we're not gonna just dump a title to you and then just say, no, we're gonna mentor you. And then it alleviates the stress for the students, but also it help us as us faculty to like not spend so much time just little by little throughout the semester instead of like all at once. So students need to submit together with me their experimental design. And then basically I grade this assignment and then I'll return to them with some feedback. Um, like for example, what is your hypothesis? What is your research question? If the question with the hypothesis did not make sense or is not testable, I'll return them to like, hey, let's modify these. Um, and I'll return the points to them. So this is not to like punish them or anything like that. It is basically, you learn um, how does you know this work and why we need to change the hypothesis and to be more specific. Uh, throughout the semester, there are different assignments. Like for example, I wanna check on you. So tell me in a research update quiz, like how's it going? Do you wanna meet? 
Um, anything about the data you want to talk about? The other assignment, for, as you can see, is um, submit what you have as preliminary data. I just want to see where you are at the moment. And the students just submit just a Word document or Excel with whatever they have. And then we, we talk about that, OK? Later on, um, the students are responsible for seeing the videos that Melissa and I have created on how to analyze the data. And then basically, um, they complete their data analysis. They make actually a presentation like this via Zoom. Um, and then they record themselves presenting and submit those videos via Canvas and all their students see their presentations. And that's what we have a peer grading activity. So everyone gets to see like what other students are doing, okay? This is just an example to show you how the templates uh, are provided to the students, um, also the rubrics. So again, these are all resources that we have in Canvas for the students. So we're not gonna tell you like, hey, just start making a presentation from scratch. Now we're gonna provide the template for you um, so that you actually have an idea of what to put in a presentation, okay? Same thing here, uh, of course, there's right now a lot of words, uh, but this is just a rubric for the students to like, so they can see what are we gonna evaluate you on. So basically the content of your research, the quality of your presentation and basically how you present yourself. So these are like very specific and then students by having these, they know what to expect, okay? And then there are actually some open time in the lecture that they can actually practice in case they wanna do, you know, they have never done this. So if they wanna practice, we'll welcome that opportunity to them, okay? Um, oops, my headphones just died. Um, can you hear me? You sound fine, Emmanuel. Can you guys hear me? Um, yeah, you sound, you sound good. Let me turn this off. Sorry about that, my phone just died. <laughs> Okay. All right. Can you guys hear me? I, I don't know if someone can let me know. Emmanuel, we can hear you fine. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so this is just a, a brief overview of what the projects look like. So this is the aquatic project created by Melissa, where basically students are responsible of like collect data from different water ponds or like lakes around. And then basically they create their own hypothesis, they collect the data, and they do this in two different locations, two different times of the semester. And again, they record videos and submit those via Canvas. So you can see here some example of pitch of students actually presenting uh, the projects. They analyze the data again, you can see that they show GPS information, they take pictures uh, with portable microscope or in the lab and then actually analyze the data. So again, all this is for the lecture and they record themselves and submit this online, okay? In my case, I created the project of pollinator networks. Um, so basically this is where like pollinators are visiting certain plants and the students go out there in nature at two different locations and then establish like a relationship of like what kind of pollinators are visiting what type of plants. So if you're studying there, if a pollinator is declining or not, and then you do not need a lab in order to study something like this. So again, students go out there in the field to different locations and look at pollinators and plants, and we provide ID resources or videos to identify plants or pollinators. So and at the end, they analyze the data, and then I can submit a presentation via Canvas and present their results. So this is just basically how it looks like. Just to show you an example, students, again, this, they are doing amazing graph. Uh, and this is based from the videos that we have created. And you can see there, these are the pictures, by the way. So they go out there and they are very interesting. They're engaging nature. Um, and then basically collect all this data. Sometimes students collect way too much because they're too excited and they make excellent presentation at the end of the day. The, uh, this is basically some of the comments. We have several comments from the students saying that uh, they never thought that they have it on them to have research, that never in a million years they thought that they were able to like study pollinators, for example, or like they are actually can do some change in the world. So we have amazing comments um, so far, students supporting this activity um, instead of having a final comprehensive exam. So this is just few of the many comments that we get throughout the semester when students at the end reflect on their project. Now, we're gonna go into the lab. The lab also have a research component, but in this particular scenario, we actually have aligned the lab with the lecture and students need to also create a research presentation here, but just poster. So here, the student gets to choose whatever you wanna do for research that fits between 
ecology and biodiversity. So if you ever has been interested in studying fungi and how does that make a whole network underground, um, this is your opportunity. So the department provides the funding, um, also the mentoring for basically students to like do whatever you want. Of course, within budget, but this is where you completely go hands on. Um, we do not have like a final in the exam, but this is just basically where students learn their lab skills, instrumentation, um, critical thinking. So this is a great opportunity. And we're taking about two research projects, one in lecture, one in lab. So students do live with an amazing experience um, and very ready for the basically what comes next. So this is just to show you some picture of how the symposium looks like. Um, students create posters, actually the college pays for those. So we as the department do not need to pay for them because the college does support this initiative. And we started very small and now it has like merged into like many classes like micro, physiology, ecology. They have merged into like this most symposium that we started um, and it has been now a big event. Okay, these are just some of the few comments that students have left. Um, this is specifically for the lab component. Um, you can see the students are saying that they are super excited to being able to create their own hypothesis to collect data by themselves, that they had no idea that they could have done something like this, or that they have no idea that it is possible to do research. Like no one talked about that with them in the past. And the fact that we're introducing this to them for the first time, it is life changing for some of them. Now, this is the interesting part when it comes to like uh, looking at the data. You can see here, uh, this is percent my data, not Melissa Hardy. Um, the final exam that I gave in 2019, you can see the average was 77 versus the average grade for um, after like the research was introduced to the class in both the lecture and the lab, you can see that the average is 93. Um, that's quite well. I mean, that's, that's amazing how students are doing way better overall when you actually include um, research in the classroom. Here, I'm showing you some data overall with all students include either first generation or not, Hispanic or not, or different race and ethnicity. So this is all the students in the class. You can see the graph here on the left side. Before we introduced research in 2019, that's where basically when I started here, you can see that we have a little bit of like A, Bs, and Cs, but then you can see the effect of introducing research. Um, thank you for letting me know. Um, into like the classroom. So you can see that we have 63% of the students in fall 20, uh, one, 2021 got basically A, and then you can see how B, Cs, Ds were basically decreasing. So this is basically working, but we actually wanted to look how does this helps on the represented communities. So we in SOCC, uh, we're becoming a Hispanic uh, serving institution uh, because about 23% of the students are actually Hispanics. So you can actually see here, um, I think, yeah, it is color coded in orange um, or light brown. That's basically if you're Hispanic and if you're dark brown in this graph, you're not Hispanic. You can see that at first, you know, it's kind of like about the same. Um, so students were like plateau with a little bit of A, a little bit of B, a little bit of C. But then when you actually introduce research, it helps both the Hispanic and actually non-Hispanic students as well. So some of these activities, when they get introduced into like classes, they, you know, people sometimes are like, is this gonna help everyone? When, when you're trying to actually help Hispanics or other races and indices, it actually helps, for example, white people. Yeah, every single student benefits from this incorporation of high impact practices in classes. This is a graph that actually show if you are first generation or not. So you can see if you actually were first generation on the left graph on fall 2019, uh, we didn't have many first generation students actually getting A's, but as soon as we actually started incorporating research, both first generation or not actually got more A's in the class and then the B's and C were more decreased, okay? So again, this is in college biology too, which is a major class. However, myself, I have been introducing this into like gen ed courses, which means there are students that are not gonna go into biology, but sometimes they need a life science course um, and they're from business. These are students from psychology and, but they need to pass you know, through some science. So I have, teaching, have been teaching plant biology, which is for non-majors. And then you can see here that, this is my first time by the way teaching the class. So I don't have a comparison of semesters. Um, you can see that this class already has research and more than 50% of the students overall already have A. And if you're Hispanic 
or not, or basically first generation or not, still having research benefit uh, students overall. And they find this class way more engaging. And some of them actually, because of the good experience, they actually have changed into biology. So I have brought them into my side just because uh, they enjoy so much the research project. You can see here, um, this is just some of them presenting in the symposiums that we make. Again, these are non-biology students. So to see some of these, and what the projects they came up with, it's just amazing. So they enjoy this experience, they enjoy biology more, and they basically, most of them pass the class and more than half of the class pass with A. The last thing I wanted to show you, uh, I know we're running a little bit out of time, is also this course here. So I'm the first faculty, I believe in Utah, uh, that actually has been teaching introduction to biology bilingually. So we wanted to remove the barrier of the language. So I teach the class in both languages, but also on top of that, I actually add in the research component. So students here uh, come with whatever they wanna do and they answer, let's do it, I have no problem. Um, and they do research, it's simple, but still significant for them. And then most of the students, back before I started, they were not passing actually this class. And then once we have now removed the barrier of the language plus adding research, most of the students are passing with A and Bs. So I think this is amazing that, you know, research helps all over the place, major classes or not. And I believe that's the end. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions um, after the 20 other minutes. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Yes, that was excellent. So I will be doing the introduction for our next speaker. Megan Hott has been organizing diversity programming and creating EDI displays at the University of Central Florida since 2012, when she worked on the COCO campus. She started at the UCF Libraries in 2016, and at the Libraries, Megan has worked on many EDI-related projects, including the thematic featured bookshelf, Diversity Week Committee Chair since 2016, is the originator of the Readings on Race list, maintains the Liberty, uh, library's diversity and inclusion page and is the STARS administrator for the library's EDI page. STARS is the UCF institutional repository. Megan also organizes additional EDI related public programming at the UCF libraries, including Woman Fest and LGTBTQIA plus History Month events. She is also a founding member of the Academic Affairs Diversity Task Force, former chair of the Task Force Education Committee, and current chair of the Diversity Speaker Series. In addition, she edits the Task Force newsletter and is the administrator for the Task Force STARS digital repository page. Megan is also a facilitator for LGBTQ Plus 101 and has an Inclusion Champion Certificate. Take it away, Megan. Thank you very much, Sandy. That was a great introduction, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this talk. As we all know, with working in libraries, even from the staff perspective, it's always a struggle to um, get students to see the library as a resource and not just the building where they go to check out calculators or take a nap. So there's lots of ways we can help connect the students to bring them in and see us as their helper and starting their research and conducting um, searches within library materials and helping associate that with what they're doing in their courses. Um, one of the quick things I'm going to mention, and as I talk, that um, members of the committee will be adding in links that I'm discussing as part of this into the chat. But before I do that, there's a link I haven't shared yet with them. It's our information literacy modules. And these modules are small Canvas modules that can be embedded in any course within Canvas at UCF. And we ha they have topics such as um, avoiding plagiarism in APA or MLA, um, citing sources, how to um, recognize a research study or start doing your um, search, creating search strategies for your um, courses. So these are great things to help students connect with what they're doing for the research and understand some of the background that librarians themselves can help create within their own colleges and then work with faculty to embed them into their courses. They include graded assignments and um, the faculty members can then um, assign their own due dates as part of this. Um, additional things I'm gonna be talking about here are libguides we have done um, both within the library and in conjunction with um, faculty and other courses. Uh, you'll notice in the links for the guides, a lot of them say hover over the item title to read the description. 
we are in the process of updating that across all libguides within the university so we can improve accessibility. And all new libguides will have this listed with um, an actual short description under the titles. So screen readers will recognize them. But as we, I get into talking about partnering with faculty to create custom guides, such as things that can be shared in introductory courses, we've got a diversity in STEM guide that I actually partnered with Sandia Via to work on. And we partnered with um, one of our faculty members. And on the first page for this guide, we've got a history of diversity in STEM. And this, um, our student created bios, short bios for um, various um, underrepresented or minoritized inventors and educators within STEM. And the students helped create those bios. We did an image as part of the bio and then additional reference links as part of that. So students can go in and read about these um, amazing educators and inventors within their own ethnicities. And they are broken up by ethnicity on this particular guide. Um, as we go and throw that guide, we've got uh, a whole link a page for sharing university recognized student organizations and national organizations to help the um, students connect with their peers, both within the university and then with the national organizations for helping with mentoring and getting involved in additional projects and finding extra research support. The last page of the guide is what we're using to help connect future generations to give parents and whether they're faculty or students or just community members, places they can go for um, fun science projects to do or reading material and children and young adults for the, um, them to inspire future generations so we can uh, expand the amount of students that are in STEM courses. And I see the little chat from um, Susan and yeah, we've talked about using the eye guide, but most of us ended up preferring the short description underwards, um, under the um, link. We also have, as Sandy mentioned, that I work with our diversity week committee. I've been chairing it since 2016. And for with our guide and diversity week, one of the big things we help to do with this, it's again, getting students into the libraries. So they see us as a place to go, a place that can does fun and interesting things that helps connect who they are as people with what we can do for them at the university. So we have film discussions where we, for the live one events, we show the film as part of the, the um, session and then the students have a discussion afterwards. We've also held um, virtual discussions where the, we provide the link for the students to watch the film beforehand and then it is discussed afterwards. Um, we don't record any of the um, discussion sessions just so students will feel more comfortable in speaking freely to give their opinions on things. As an example, one of our virtual film discussions this past fall was um, Dolores. Talking about Dolores, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce her last name, Curtis, um, work with um, farm workers. And the students were so engaged speaking about this. And some were there as part of a course for extra credit, but not all the students. And everyone was engaged with speaking about what they learned in the film and the things they didn't know and how it could apply to their life. We also do a lot of uh, hands-on activities to give students avenues for expressions. Uh, we, they're very enthusiastic about doing um, any type of fiber arts. We've had the Weavers of Orlando, which is a local community group in fiber arts, help with um, demonstrations on weaving before, uh, teaching students how to work with fiber. But they've also done history presentations of the impact of cotton throughout history. So for the trade in cotton, where the various types of cotton we're using now were originally developed and how they merged into the markets, and then also the impacts of slavery on and the emphasis with um, the intersection with cotton. We also do, um, this past year, we did a Crochet Your Pride flag event where students were given the supplies for whatever option they want and then taught how to crochet pride flags. And they're very enthusiastic about that. We're looking actually to do more crochet and fiber arts related work for this. 
we also host open mic events and have had uh, local community groups in as presentations as part of Diversity Week. One of our big latest projects for helping connect students, and it's not just to show students that we see who they are, we recognize that not everybody has the same history and background and ethnicity, but to help them share information for people who might not be familiar with areas outside of their own experience. It's our Readings on Race Guide. And this was a big partnership. The um, intro page was edited both through um, the university marketing and through the provost to make sure we were um, using approved language as part of it. But then we cover all sorts of topics like our general education on racism. And this particular section of the guide has an intro from our, was our interim uh, associate director for diversity inclusion. And this was written uh, right after the George Floyd murder. But the guide is purposed for providing history and background on minoritized identities within the US and then providing more information about ways they have been minoritized and then history about some very interesting people as well as the impacts that um, trying to figure out a good way to phrase that, um, the impacts of racism that racism has had on um, their education and their lives. And with our allyship and advocacy, what we can do to help. And that particular page is broken out with um, resources that are different from how we've done on the other pages. The early bits of the readings on race guide covering African-American black identities, Arab American, Asian Pacific American, Cuban American, which was partnered with for um, our housing department. They helped put this together as well as shared um, uh, events that they have done as part of that. Um, Hispanic and Latin, Indigenous American and multiracial, but they're all broken out as print books, eBooks, streaming videos, and then children's and young adult books. And one of the big bonuses for our university is we have a curriculum material center so we do have a full collection of children's and young adult books. Um, but our Alley and Advocacy Ship page is um, grouped slightly differently. We've got online resources, which is predominantly websites, some video, and then the rest is grouped for how to support educators, supporting and connecting with parents, and then for family, friends, and community. So helping people discuss the topics with others around them. It also helps highlight our Diverse Families Bookshelf, which um, started as a love project by our head of interlibrary loan and document delivery services, who um, has an interracial family and realized there's not a lot of children books out there that are geared for non-white families. And a lot of children's books in general, animals are the main character, but there's also no way to search this information and especially within library collections. So the Diverse Families Bookshelf is essentially a giant reading list that um, specifies um, primary, secondary, and other identities. Some of them have, um, as part of our College of Education, um, have um, guides associated with them that were created by students and um, lesson plans that can be um, used by other faculty and used by stu um, student educators and just by parents in general. When we get onto the uh, featured bookshelf, it is, this is not a currently active project. It has, through the pandemic, been um, set aside for a bit, but the featured bookshelf is a curated reading list, predominantly um, faculty and staff suggestions within the library featuring across topics. So for like, as an example, February is Black History Month, Women's History Month in March, National Poetry Month in April, with faculty and staff suggestions on their favorite books with an emphasis on um, broadcasting uh, minoritized voices and self-inserts and people being able to talk about their own experiences within those areas. And this definitely has been something we have also seen some pushback on and some complaints. We've had several comments for several students complaining that 
American History Month in July didn't feature enough white people. And this is unfortunately the phrasing that was used as part of it. But we're hoping to show that there's more than just one voice that can be heard and that more voices across this country have an impact on what we do and what we experience every day. So helping to expand that experience for others. Uh, when we get to the Academic Affairs Diversity Task Force, this one falls more into the passion project for me. That I'm one of the um, founding members. We had originally started this as a way just for uh, the libraries used to be classified with IT, which is at the university still predominantly white, middle-aged, heterosexual men. And we need to expand the diversity within this. And it's about been broad, um, broadened out since then to accommodate all of academic affairs, which includes all the academic colleges within the university. And um, as part of that, we've gotten developed LinkedIn learning training lists that are up on part of the um, STARS, which is our e-press-based digital repository that we've worked with LinkedIn Learning to create with its five different subsets of training courses that faculty members, students, and um, staff can do. And now that we've um, moved into Workday, if anybody's experienced that one, um, LinkedIn Learning actually now shows within Workday, which is our HR and finance accounting system. So people can search it within Workday, do the course, and then it automatically logs on their HR record that they've completed the course and gotten their certificate for it. Um, but one of the big things we do is our diversity speaker series. And the series, series invites in speakers, mostly tenure track faculty within the university to talk about um, some of their experiences and their research and how to better support students and the community. For example, uh, Dr. Jonathan Cox last February lecture was hashtag black faculty matter, supporting, retaining and hiring black faculty. We've also done series on um, invisible disabilities and supporting veteran students. And through with that, and we're hoping to expand more this semester that we're on a slight pause as we figure out what's going on with the state of Florida regulations regarding DEI programming at universities. So we're Hoping to hear more in another week or so. But one of the big things I want to push through with all of this is as librarians, get your professional staff involved in these projects with working on libguides and helping with things for um, academic faculty. Get your staff involved. It helps expand the diversity experience and viewpoints. They're going to see things you might not necessarily see. It also helps lighten your workload. And then it provides them with that extra experience, especially for the ones doing their own degrees, giving them that experience so they can bring this into librarianship when they become librarians. So this helps advance us all as a professional community. So as we're getting involved with this, it's, it's fun, it's heartrending sometimes being able to have that connection point with the students so they come in and they see there is so much to offer here within the library that we can connect with them so much better so they know we're here, we recognize them, and they're more likely to come to us for as a resource to do their um, research. So they know like, oh, the science librarian understands me. They, she's created all sorts of great projects from me to come in and like work on and trust out or like um, eclipse viewing and they met her through that. And so they're like, oh, I can come in, I can talk to her and she can help me find the references I need or get started on what I'm looking for for research to help narrow down my topic. So it's being able to bring them in to connect with them in a meaningful way so that they'll come in and use us for other things and see us as part of their whole experience of being in education and learning instead of just the place where they hide in the corner to take a nap. 
And so thank you very much. Thank you, Megan. So this was um, the end of our presentation. So we're gonna open up the floor for 10 minutes. Hopefully someone can keep me on track on the 10 minutes, please. <laughs> um, I think we had one comment in the, in the chat and we will keep the uh, question and answer open um, through um, the video through these 10 minutes. But if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question or I have a few that I could start off with, um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you all raise your hand or feel free to unmute. As you all are thinking, I think um, in, in the way that we put together this session, we wanted to incorporate ideas um, in working with liaison librarians from both a faculty perspective and a non-librarian um, library staff perspective. So I think we were able to um, provide some great examples. So thank you to you both for um, giving us kind of like a way for um, helping marginalized um, students kind of connect with library, um, whether it's directly or indirectly and um, having those kinds of events and um, curriculum and liaisons to, to provide that um, connectivity and connection. Hearing no questions yet, no raised hands. I do have one to start us off. So for our speakers, have you uh, been doing similar work with students? or for anyone, um, have you been doing similar work with students and faculty to get them involved with undergraduate research? This is for anyone out there. Um, how are you engaging with your students in undergraduate research? I can start. Yeah, so we, uh, Melissa and I started uh, in 2020, this research, um, and then two years later, uh, I mentioned this briefly, we have now um, several faculty, microbiology, physiology, ecology, uh, joining us. And then on top of that, I don't, I don't know what happened, but I think it's all like spread around. And now you even have like humanities and other areas and departments and schools doing research. And uh, you now see several of these events happening at the end of every semester where like, you're like, wow, uh, we're doing this and it's benefiting everyone, science or not. And of course, um, it's helping uh, underrepresented students in any area. So yes, yeah, so we, I'm not saying like me and Melissa and I started everything. I'm sure there were other faculty doing things around, but after people seeing us at least in battle doing this, they have now started doing this more into their classes. And I particularly do not know their data about like GPA or their average on how they do on their research, but I do know that the students are passing the class even more. So that is a good sign and we wanna keep it doing that way um, and keep, and it's, it's now here to stay, oh, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. With uh, UCF and the libraries, we've been doing a lot of expansion for our undergraduate research program. So we'll have several library faculty members who act as judges as part of student research week and help judge and evaluate poster presentations by students. We're having actually a big um, exhibition for that on along our large display wall in March, and we'll be hosting a reception for them as well. And then we are also for one of the sections of student research week funding a prize of $250 for one of the categories. That's great. Those are wonderful examples. And Sue put in the chat, I'll read her um, response. Some of our undergraduate research assignments and research experience programs require a librarian meeting or a host a library workshop focused on search, evaluation, et cetera. I, I definitely liked one of the ways, um, Dr. Emanuel, that, that in terms of the language, I love that, you know, creating uh, you know, that barrier, if Spanish was a barrier for students, you know, understanding the, the language, you know, you being able to produce um, content and classwork in, in a native um, tongue, I think that it's, it's an, a nice touch to be able to bring students to the same level to, not, to give them that, you know, the, the, the playing field needs to be the same for them to be able to succeed, which I thought that was really great. I have a couple things in the chat. So Manuel says, yes, Amy has been doing great um, 
great doing the library instruction in one of my classes and helping my students. Yeah, shout out to all of the liaison librarians, right? Because that's, there's a lot that we do there. Sue mentions again, does anyone have a program that bridges student research and relevant publications written by folks from historically underrepresented groups? The metadata isn't available from publishers to make these matches efficient. So we have a question to the group. A program that bridges student research and relevant publications written by historically underrepresented groups. I, mean, I don't have a specific answer for these, but I know that, for example, Amy has been able to like help search, you know, students some of the papers and manuscripts. Because I do require my students to, um, you need to cite and you need to look for real scientific articles. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but like Amy has been able to like help my students search for like peer review articles. Um, and what I'm gonna say now is not directly to your question, but actually what I'm trying to now bring to my students is actually different collaborations with different entities here in Utah, like, um, you know, something about molecular stuff with mosquitoes by the government or some organization doing stuff with pollinators. And uh, you mentioned articles. So students actually, once they get linked with this organization, and if they actually want to continue research, they might be actually the ones doing the publication. So look at that from community college all the way to probably publication. So, um, so yeah, we're doing, we're trying to do all that and it's it's gonna take some time but it's it's starting amy puts in the chat but it is difficult to specifically find literature in this group you mentioned sue i'd certainly like to see better metadata to help connect students with those sources All right, another question. I think we still have a few minutes, right? My timekeepers, a couple more minutes left. So one other question I can, I can pose to the group um, or to our speakers, how are you inspired to do similar work after hearing these talks? Do you have any future project ideas? And this is, could be for the speakers or to, um, to everyone. We do have another question in the chat after this. Well, one of the little things that we're working on and it's, and I do get inspired by the talks, even if I'm the person in the background running it, I get inspired what is said and some of the little accessibility things we can help do for students that are smaller things even, such as adding free tampon and pad dispensers in our bathrooms, both in the women's bathrooms and our um, new single stall bathroom, adding baby changing stations across all bathrooms. So these little things that, um, give it better accessibility to students, especially student parents as they're coming in or uh, lower income students that need the extra help. We're also currently working on a project for creating little kits for kids with coloring pages and they're going to be UCF libraries branded pages that we've created ourselves with like stickers and crayons and stuff that when parents bring their kids in, particularly on weekends and evenings, they can be given that and then the kids have something to do while their parent studies. And so it's hearing the little talks and getting seeing the comments that um, help inspire being able to do these smaller projects. I will be answering uh, Sarah's uh, question, a great question on the comments section. Um, so I don't have per se like numerical uh, data, but I have a lot of like emails uh, and anecdotes from students. Uh, after they transfer, they say that they have been way more successful in understanding, like they actually uh, understand the classes in a four year institution way more. And actually I have the opposite. When I have students that already have completed a four year degree, for example, the University of Utah, um, or are almost finishing, and then they go back to like the community college because they need some pre-requirements for like health sciences related careers. And then when they pass through my class, they're like, wait, do I need to do research? I never had done like such a microscope before or have, or have done like DNA extraction. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, uh, so we are actually providing them with so many skills that actually 
some of them at the four-year institution, for some reason, they're not getting because some of the labs are optional. In our case, labs are required, but if for some reason you are you cannot take the lab, still in lecture, you need to do some research. And then students have been grateful and actually have been having some emails from students saying that because they have the actually experience with research, this is something that they can actually add on their CV or resume. So it is helping them to get scholarship for transfer or Hispanic you know, um, scholarships or many other type of scholarships or fellowships. So overall, we're trying to help you in the class, but this is helping them to be more secure than, of themselves as biologists and actually getting some funding to like cover some of their careers. So I think this is magnificent. Like there is impact all over the place here. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think we're about at time for the group questions. So I think at this point we will break out into um, separate um, breakout rooms. We have at least four more questions that we can discuss in the breakout rooms. And um, 